Hello, <laughs> welcome to an adventure. Um, I have not had a chance to adjust anything for stream today. One second, I need to adjust the camera. Also, do let me know if you can hear me. Okay. I, I think that might be slightly better. I may need to adjust the camera one more time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, Wow. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, we had some actual technical difficulties this morning. Um, I got in here, started to get set up, and the, we use a device called a Perl 2 to run the streams, and that requires me to log into a web interface to actually control the device or to actually physically get the device over to me. And I went to log into the back end of the device and actually control things, and it did not connect. Because for some reason, the IP address of the admin portal for the Perl 2 changed. And I did not know this. So I was sitting here, and all of my setup time, I was trying to figure out how I could connect to actually make the stream go live. Um, I tried different ethernet ports, I tried everything I could think of, and finally we figured out that the IP address had changed and I got that in, uh, but I also recently changed my password on one of the Twitch channels that I broadcast to, which changes your stream key, and I needed to get that stream key put in to the back end of the Perl 2 so that I'd be able to go live on both channels. So lots of technical difficulties. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Archivist Kira, thank you for letting everybody know there were technical delays. Hannah, welcome. Key Squared, welcome to the chaos. Um, uh, Fluidan, it's good to see you. <laughs> um, I, I do want to still do our uh, top of stream um, acknowledgments. These are, the text of this is the official uh, land and labor acknowledgments for the university. Um, so I'm going to read those to you now, and then we're going to look at some uh, archives related to NASA. Um, I know the stream title does not say what the, what the topic is today because I didn't get those updated before I went live. Sorry about that, uh, but I'll tell you what we're looking at in just a minute. Um, first, uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through Inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Utprosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So that is the updated language that the school has put out for uh, land and labor acknowledgments. Um, they put it out just before beginning all their celebrations for the 150th anniversary of Virginia Tech. I suspect that that timing was not um, not coincidental, uh, but this is a huge improvement over the language that we've had over the past couple of years, um, and hopefully it's indicative of a change in the, um, 
actual commitment to uh, addressing these issues on a systemic level. Um, I read it at the top of every show because I think it's important to make these acknowledgments. Um, and I think it's important to keep that, the history of the land that we're on and what has happened here in mind as we're looking at history of the institution and of uh, the world in general. So, <laughs> the plan for our adventure today is uh, the Marjorie Rhodes Townsend papers. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, Marjorie Rhodes, Rhodes Townsend and why we have her papers, uh, what we're interested in um, with these papers. So I'm looking at the finding aid, which uh, Kira may be able to drop a link to the finding aid in the chats um, if you're still around, Kira. Um, Marjorie Rhodes Townsend was born in 1930 entered the George Washington University engineering program at the age of 15. Uh, she took classes part-time and worked full-time after her marriage to Dr. Charles Townsend in 1948 and was the first woman to earn an engineering degree at George Washington University, receiving her Bachelor of Electrical Engineering in 1951. Her career began with eight years at the Naval Research Laboratory where she worked on sonar research. In 1959, she moved to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Goddard Space Flight Center where she worked until 1980. Noted for her project management skills, Townsend oversaw three satellite launches from foreign locations. She was project manager for all three small astronomy satellites, 1966 to 1975, and for the Applications Explorer missions, 1975 and 6. Uh, she was granted a patent for a digital telemetry system that was aboard the Nimbus satellite. Her last five years at NASA included responsibility for all advanced mission planning for future scientific and applications satellites, as well as NOAA's meteorological satellites. After her retirement, Townsend worked for private aerospace companies and provided consulting services to NASA and other aerospace entities. Townsend was awarded the NASA, NASA Exceptional Service Medal in 1971 and the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal in 1980. She was also named Knight of the Italian Rep Republic Order in 1972. She is a Fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and served as a Chair of the Washington Chapter. She also served as chairman of the National Capital Section of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and is a past president of the Washington Academy of Sciences. So the papers that we have here focus on her professional career in aerospace engineering at NASA, um, as well as some of her later consulting work. The bulk is correspondence uh, with scientists, notes from staff meetings, documentation about her NASA projects, and publications she wrote or that relate to her work. A uh, couple of drafts of speeches, mostly to engineering student and women's professional groups, and some articles about her professional accomplishments. So, we have her stuff. Um, I'm assuming that we got her stuff because it is NASA related. Um, we have a there are a couple of, of possible reasons. We have a, a number of collections related to NASA. We've looked at a, at least one or two of them before. Um, we also have um, at our institution uh, a, a strong connection with the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, the IEEE, um, as well as the Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So it's also possible that we have her materials because of those connections. But regardless, we have them, and we're going to be looking at them today. Um, interestingly enough, I pulled this collection more than a week ago uh, to include on... Sorry, I, I got distracted. Um, the links to the finding aid are in the chat. Um, I pulled this content, I pulled this collection um, more than a week ago because I was planning to share it on stream and then out of the blue, after I pulled it and had it sitting on a cart in my office, we had a researcher, a, a student in a first year English class, 
um, request to see it. Uh, so it left my office for a brief period while that student came in and looked at it. Um, but then also uh, one of the other archivists who does quite a lot of our instruction, um, without any communication between us, I, I had already decided to use this collection for instruction for a class that is happening right now. So <laughs> I have boxes two, three, and four, and he has box one for the class. Um, I am going to be visiting this collection both this week and next week. So next week I will have box one and we can look at items in there. Um, but we, we ended up having to split the collection and share it for today because while this collection does not get used a ton, we've had three different uses for this collection in the last week and a half. Um, so I, I'm going to switch this over to the document view and actually start pulling out the documents and we'll look at them. Um, also, after we do this collection, so this collection is the one that we're going to be doing for the rest of uh, September. And then after that, when we get into October, I'm going to be looking for some spooky and creepy things to share on stream. Um, I know for one, for one week, I will be sharing with you the things that we have that have actual human hair in them. Uh, and then we have some literature collections, so I may look for some scary stories that are old enough for me to actually read on stream. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, but for now, let's look at the stuff that's in this collection. I'm not sure where I want to start. I've got boxes and they're heavy. Oh, let's see. Program X space fl Spacecraft User's Guide? Sure. That seems like a good place to start. Also, I hope everybody is having a good uh, Wednesday. It's Wednesday today. I hope everybody's having a great Wednesday. Um, and that you're not having the same technical difficulties that I experienced. <laughs> Uh, they've just thrown me just a slight bit off, but, but we're doing okay. Uh, so here we have the Program X Spacecraft User's Guide. Um, I do not know what Program X is. Hopefully this guide will tell me. Uh, but you can see the diagram in the middle there. I'm guessing that that is the Program X spacecraft. And then we have the Boeing Aerospace Company, 1973, as uh, the publisher for this item. This says that it is from the Egret notebook. So if anybody knows about the Egret program, E-G-R-E-T, um, it's in all caps. I'm assuming that it is an abbreviation for something, um, and most likely NASA related. But let's take a look at this book. No technical difficulties for you as of right now. Currently working on 14 rings and three chains. Ooh. I, I also hope that you have no difficulties with any of them, Hannah. All right, introduction. The X spacecraft is a standard service module, SSM, for supporting scientific experiments and development test items in the near Earth environment. Primary features of the spacecraft are as follows up to 300 pounds of experiments, uh, apogee attitudes to 5,000 nautical miles, up to 16 cubic feet of volume. Um, also, if you wish me to read the parentheticals, do let me know. Otherwise, I'm, I'm just going to skip them, and you can see them on screen. Um, but those would be the kilograms and kilometers and cubic meters. Uh, if you want me to say them out loud, just uh, drop a note in chat, and I will do so in the future. Um, 128 on-off commands, 7 magnitude commands, 180 watt-hours for one orbit per day, 600 watt-hours per day. Uh, recording capacity for one full orbit, data recorded at 16,384 bits per second, real-time or recorded operation. 
attitude determined to 1.5 degrees and 1.5 nautical miles, spin stabilization and thermal control of 60 plus or minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. But what is it? <laughs> I mean, it's a service module. That's, that's what we know so far. It is a standard service module. SSM performance versatility. Standard service module provides a wide range of Apogee attitudes, alti or altitudes. Altitude is controlled by selecting one of several available solid rocket motors, orbital parameters, for example, occultation time, Van Allen belt exposure, tracking station exposure, etc., may be adjusted by varying the time of the solid rocket motor ignition. Ah, Egret, Energetic Gamma Ray Telescope. Thank you, Key Squared. Satellite structural arrangement, you get a nice little diagram here. The prism shape of the spacecraft was developed to maximize the volume within the launch vehicle envelope. 16 cubic feet are available for experiments. Experiments are located using structural bracketry kits to optim optimize field of view and meet spacecraft requirements for thermal and mass balance. Access to installed experiments is provided by removal of the solar panels. Experiments are usually mounted within the spacecraft bays. Experiments have been externally mounted on the sides of the spacecraft, on the magnetometer boom, and the top of the rocket motor mount. Command system, let's see what else we got. Power system, data system. This is, uh, like uh, last week we were looking at technical manuals and this is sort of a technical manual but for a spacecraft. Uh, thermal control. Let's see, I'm looking to see what jumps out as I jump through this here. Interesting. Program X. I'm very, I just, I'm very curious about that name. Was that like a code name for the program or I, I don't know why this is Program X, but that would probably be, if I was using this for research, that would probably be the very first place that I went is to, to see if I could figure out why Program X. So here we have notebook entitled Egret. <laughs> That's lit, the, the folder just says notebook entitled Egret. And here we are. It is a spiral bound notebook titled Egret. Uh, and here you see business card stapled to the front. Goddard Space Flight Center, Greenbelt, Maryland, Mrs. Marjorie R. Townsend, Project Manager, Small Astronomy Satellites. Um, that's possible, I guess, key squared, that it was, that it means uh, it was the 10th project. My guess is more that um, before it was officially announced, it had a code name that it went by, um, and that Egret became the official name, but that it was Project X before that. That would be my suspicion, because I know that that happened um, in the tech world, and I know that that happened in the NASA world uh, for various things, but it, I would have to research it to be sure. But that, that would be my, my first guess, um, and then I would have to explore that to see. Um, let's see here. Lots of handwritten notes on this first page that mean very little to me. Let's see, we've got some names and contact information at the top. Um, this is all 1940s stuff. So uh, I would not try dialing these phone numbers and expect to reach the same people. We've got Stanford, we've got, uh, looks like Fairbanks, uh, something Everest or Everett, 
Ron Gould, that is a name that, uh, if you're familiar with NASA history, should be recognizable. Um, he was the assistant director of Hanson Labs at this time. Uh, Barry Hughes, the assistant to Hofstadter. Uh, Bob Hofstadter, Tim Harrington. It's definitely Everett. I can't read the full... Wait, Lord Portico, you're an expert on this? Do tell. <clears throat> While I take a sip of water uh, and back away from the documents. Wait, you're an Everett when you're not a torpedo? I see. <laughs> um, sorry, my chair keeps rolling over the cord that to my headphones. It might be a first name. I, so, oh, I can read it now. For some reason, I took another look at it and immediately it says Francis Everett. <clears throat> so, and given the, the place that this is here, I don't know, I feel like that is all under Stanford. So I'm guessing Francis Everett was at Stanford. I did not know that portico. Um, I'm not going to say it on stream, but I did not know that. You're just portico to me. <clears throat> Hi, was not worth it. How are you today? I saw um, I saw what you did. This is not the stream where I'm going to talk about it, but thank you very much. You're a creature of mystery. Uh, you're a torpedo, is what you are. Uh, uh, oh, we've got Egret. We have the co-principal investigator was Dr. Bob Hofstadter at Stanford. Co-principal investigator Carl uh, Fructel. Co-investigator Mike Summer, Tony Favale. So this is research study, Egret, APL, I'm sure these notes make sense to someone. They don't make tons of sense to me, but they're definitely like academic research project. Hi Cypher, how are you? Um, Kira, on, uh, on the Rogan27 channel, can you do a shout out for Cypher of Tear? Uh, if you're not following Cypher of Tear, you should definitely do so. Um, today is archival adventures. Uh, so this is um, my Wednesday stream where I share materials from the Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. And today we're looking at materials from Marjorie Rhodes Townsend, who was um, an early female engineer uh, at NASA. So she was um, the first woman to earn an engineering degree at George Washington University, and then she went on to work at NASA and ran three, all three um, small words, uh, small, I read this a little bit ago, small astronomy satellite missions. She ran all three SAS missions uh, for NASA. Wait, key squared, you met Francis Everett. He's a gravitational physicist. It, it's entirely possible that it's the same person. Um, this person apparently worked at Stanford uh, during Project Egret. He's still at Stanford. <laughs> so right now we're looking through a notebook on uh, Project Egret, uh, which... Key squared, I think you gave me the name of. Uh, Energetic Gamma Ray Telescope. Um, and I just, I have a notebook here from Marjorie Townsend's papers that we're, we're paging through at the moment. I'm not sure. I'm gonna flip a little bit ahead, see if 
egret experiment cost estimate. This, this sounds interesting. Everett is the current chairman of the ICRAN ICRANET steering committee for the ICRANET Center at the Leland Stanford Junior University. I don't know what uh, ICRAN stands for, but he's chairman of the steering committee for that. Um, all right, so the Egret experiment, uh, let's see, looks like this was in 1974, and we've got the spark chamber hardware appears to be the largest cost here, uh, original estimate Seems like it was um, one million six hundred and fifty thousand six hundred, uh, and then in August of seventy four, that was uh, revised to two million, and then at some point, it looks like it was revised to two point four million. Um, <laughs> So uh, the costs for this experiment definitely went up over time. Um, spark chamber readout ended up at 500,000. Spark chamber HV pulser ended up at 300,000. Did we not get the shout out? Hmm. There we go. So quite an expensive uh, experiment here. <laughs> no, but I wanted to do the shout out. I got it. It's in there. <laughs> Let's see, project office operations, scientific data analysis. Let me see if there's a grand total for the project. We have it broken out by fiscal years. And these are in thousands. So fiscal year 75, it looks like, oh, let me zoom out a little bit for you. Fiscal year 75, the Estimated cost for that year is 128,000. Fiscal year 76 is 2,300 and 2,203.2,000. So uh, that'd be 2.2 .2 million. Fiscal year 77, um, 1.6 million. Fiscal year 78, 735,000. 79, 513,000. 80, 185,000, and total 5,365,100 is the cost estimate for the Egret uh, experiment. <laughs> um, no, Kira, I, you're actively working downstairs, so I, I understand that you occasionally need to step away because literally every five seconds somebody pops into your office to ask you a question. Um, let's see, what else do we have? I'm going to... I'm going to move to the next folder. That's what I'm going to do because we have lots of stuff here. Uh, materials from Egret Notebook. Let's see. We've been looking at Egret for a little bit. Let me see what else is here. Also, I have some uh, models and stuff. Notes from trip to Italy. Ah, this one sounds good. So Marjorie Townsend was the um, lead on the Small Astronomy Satellites projects. 
here I have the mission of the SAS-C satellite, which was the third of the small astronomy satellites. Uh, so this was the third one that she ran. Um, all three of these missions, she project managed the launch of these um, spacecraft, and all three of them were launched outside the US. So SAS-C, just judging from um, context here, the fact that this is in both English and Italian, and uh, from the biographical information that I have about her, that she received, um, uh, she was named Knight of the Italian Republic Order in 1972. Um, I'm going to extrapolate. Now, I do not know this for certain, and we may find out as we go through these documents, but I'm guessing that SASC probably launched from somewhere in Italy. Um, I have two copies each of this booklet from the Goddard Space Flight Center, the mission of the SASC satellite. Um, I have one, two copies in English and two copies in Italian. I don't happen to read Italian, so I'm going to set those aside and we'll look at the uh, English version. <laughs> you need a badge that says technical liaison. All right, the mission of the SASC satellite, 1975. The goals of the SASC mission are to measure the X-ray emission of discrete extragalactic extra sources to monitor the intensity and spectra of galactic X-ray sources from 0 0.1 to 50 something. I do not know this unit of measure. Let's find out what it means. Ah, okay, so that is a kilo electron volt, the KEV. Uh, so they're wanting to measure the intensity and spectra of galactic X ray sources from 0 0.1 to 50 kilo electron volts, which is equal to 1,000 electron volts. And an electron volt is the measure of an amount of kinetic energy gained by a single electron accelerating from rest through an electric potential difference of one volt in vacuum, um, which is physics, and slightly above my head, uh, since I am an archivist and not a physicist. But, okay, uh, to perform a sky survey for new celestial X-ray sources and to monitor the X-ray intensity of SCO X1. Okay, ooh. This mission is the third in the series of small astro astronomy satellites. The first satellite, SAS-1, better known as Uhuru, was launched from the San Marco platform on December 12, 1970. Uhuru has surveyed the celestial sphere to look for stars that emit X-rays in the energy range from 2 to 20 kiloelectron volts and has discovered 125 new sources. These, plus the 36 sources discovered by sounding rockets before the launch of Uhuru, make a total of 161 X-ray sources known today. The SAS-C mission, working from the base provided by these discoveries, will determine more accurately the positions of X-ray sources discovered by Uhuru. In addition, it will study them over the energy range from 0 0.1 to 50 kiloelectron volts. This is the kind of X-ray astronomy that eventually led to being able to spot high-energy black holes. Thank you, Key Squared. I, so I, I like NASA stuff. I don't know a lot of like the, the smaller missions like this because uh, as an observer from the outside, like manned missions into space, those are what I know more about. Um, this is much more of the exploration of space and the cosmos, um, the more like scientific side of NASA, which I think is really cool. I just haven't had time to actually delve into it. Um, and this was just, sitting on shelves in our archives, and I had not noticed that it was there until I went looking for something to do on stream. Let's see, structural and thermal design of the satellite, power system, command system. This is a very informational packet about this specific satellite. 
the experiment section of the SASC satellite. Let's find out more about the experiment section. This experiment was built by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The principal investigator is Professor George Clark. Co-investigators include Professors Walter Lewin, Hale Bratt, and Saul Rappaport of MIT, and Dr. Herbert uh, Skopner of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. The overall objective of the SASC experiment is to perform a detailed investigation of those areas of X-ray astronomy which are essential to an understanding of the physical processes involved in the generation of X-rays by celestial bodies. The areas of X-ray astronomy which will be investigated include the location of X-ray sources to 15 arc seconds, the existence of I and identification of very weak extragalactic sources, the properties of transient X-ray phenomena associated with novas and supernovas, the absorption of the low-energy diffuse X-ray background by interstellar matter, the long and short-term variations of SCO X1, the detailed energy spectrum of X-ray sources, and the background from 0.1 kilo electron volts to 50 kilo electron volts. Periodic time variations of X-ray sources with periods from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the third seconds. Let's see. Provide the basis for the organization of the MIT payload. Four different experiments, collimiter, counters, electronics, more specialized operations of aspect determination, the pulse, pulse height analysis, and high-speed event sampling are performed by the payload as well. Ah, <laughs> let's jump straight to the descriptions. Yeah, it is really cool. The four onboard experiments are the extragalactic experiment, the galactic monitor experiment, uh, the Scorpio monitor experiment, and the galactic absorption experiment. The extragalactic experiment will investigate the existence of very weak extragalactic X-ray sources. This experiment will view a 100 square degree region of the sky around the direction of the plus Z axis, spin axis, of the satellite. The spin axis direction will be kept near one or another of several specific stations for long periods of time. The nominal targets of a one-year study are the Virgo cluster of galaxies, M87, for four months, the Andromeda galaxy, M31, for three months, and the Large Mag Magellanic Cloud for three months, and the Galactic Equator for two months. Oh, and <laughs> welcome. Welcome, everybody, from 16-Bit Eric. Eric, thank you so much for the raid. Uh, welcome, Whimsies, to Archival Adventures. Um, Adventures of Tony, thank you so much for the nine-month resubscription. Um, today on Archival Adventures, we are looking at the Marjorie Rhodes Townsend papers. Uh, Marjorie Rhodes Townsend uh, was born in 1983. Um, she was the first woman to earn an engineering degree at George Washington University, receiving her Bachelor of Electrical Engineering in 1951. Uh, and she began her career with eight years at the Naval Research Laboratory working on sonar uh, and then moved over to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center where she worked until around 1980. Um, she was project manager for all three of the small astronomy satellites missions uh, and um, did some consulting work later on in her career. And we're currently in the middle of looking at um, looking at a booklet entitled The Mission of the SASC Satellite. Uh, this was the third of the small astronomy satellites um, that she uh, managed the launch of. And so we're looking at um, specifically what experiments were being performed by this satellite that she was involved in launching. So welcome in everybody. Hi, Adventures of Tony. Um, <laughs> the sassy satellite. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it is the SASE satellite. Um, <laughs> so we are looking at this collection this week and next week. I'm here every Wednesday from 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time uh, to explore the archives from Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. So uh, hang out and take a look at some NASA history with me this week and next week before we move into some... Uh, spooky related stuff for October. So we were just looking at the uh, extragalactic experiment uh, where 
they were targeting with the satellite the Virgo cluster, the Andromeda galaxy, and the Large Magellanic Cloud, um, and the galactic equator for study. The instrumentation of the extragalactic experiment consists of a rotating uh, modulation collimator with a four arc minute resolution uh, of 12 degrees by 12 degrees full width half maximum a field of view, and three proportional counters of a 140 square centimeter sensitive area each. Uh, again, uh, so these are sensitive over 1.5 to 10 kilo electron volts. Um, okay, so the galactic monitor experiment has two major objectives. The location of the galactic uh, location of galactic X-ray sources to 15 arc seconds and the monitoring of the celestial sky for flares and other unexpected X-ray phenomena. Accomplished using a pair of collimator counter systems, one front looking and the other viewing along the spin axis. Precise location of the galactic X-ray sources is accomplished with a 12 degree by 12 degree rotating modulation collimator again. Uh, let's see. GME Sky Monitor will identify X-ray events in two energy bands, 1.3 to 5 kilo electron volts and 5 to 13 kilo electron volts. All right, the Scorpio Monitor experiment will study the time variations of the SCO X1. So this is We've had SCO X1 mentioned multiple times, and now I feel like I need to look it up because I don't know what it is. Scorpius X1 is an X-ray source located roughly 9,000 light years away in the constellation Scorpius. Scorpius X1 was the first extrasolar X-ray source discovered, and aside from the sun, it is the strongest apparent source of X-rays in the sky. The X-ray flux varies day to day and is associated with an optically visible star, V818 Scorpii, uh, that has an apparent magnitude which fluctuates between 12 and 13. So SCO X1 is talking about the star, or the X-ray source at uh, Scorpius or sorry, at V818 Scorpii. All right, so they want to study the time variations of SCO X1 in the energy interval from 0.2 to 50 kilo electron volts. A total of nine energy intervals will be monitored so that we will observe not only the overall intensity variations, but also the changes in the broad spectrum and in the intensities of line emissions. Two Similar but independent detection systems with different look directions and fields of view are used to allow monitoring of SCO X1 in a variety of spacecraft orientations. <laughs> good luck, Kira. Have a good meeting, and I will see you later. Um, all right. So, and then. The last experiment built onto this satellite was the Galactic Absorption Experiment, uh, designed to study the absorption of the low energy diffuse extragalactic X-ray background by interstellar matter. By measuring the variation in the intensity of this background as a function of galactic latitude at various energies, we expect to determine the density and distribution of the interstellar matter. Two detection systems are employed with fields of view centered respectively five degrees above and in the equatorial plane of the satellite. The difference in the rates of counts in the two systems will be a measure of the difference in the absorption of the background x-rays by the interstellar matter. This difference measurement should allow an accurate assessment of the absorption effects even in the presence of the expected variations in the cosmic ray background, which is a function of the geomagnetic position of the satellite. Cool. The SAS functional controls section and experiment are much more complex than those of SAS-1 Uhuru and SAS-2. It is hoped that the data to be acquired from SAS-C will be as exciting and important as those from its two predecessors. Today, the fields of X-ray and gamma-ray astronomy have become a very important part of science. So, and as you can see here, the credits for this project in the back of the 
booklet. Let's zoom in a little bit so that you can see them better. But uh, at the Goddard Space Flight Center, which provided the project management for the SASC project, you have Marjorie Townsend, uh, who's, who's listed there without even a title, uh, but she was the head of project management for this. Um, Dr. Carl Fichtel, uh, project scientist, John Bosworth, spacecraft manager, Anthony uh, Caporali, experiment manager, Norman uh, Petersky, mission operations manager. At MIT, they have Richard Taylor as a project engineer and Dr. William Mayer as project scientist. At the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University, they had Henry Riblet, project engineer, and Frederick Mobley, project scientist. Uh, Vote Systems Division, LTV Aerospace Corp, Scout Launch Vehicle, Kenneth L. Jacobs. At the Langley Research Center, they had uh, Roland D. English for launch vehicle management. And at the Centro Recherche Aerospatiali del Università degli Studi di Roma, Professor Luigi Broglio. Um, so that would be at the Center for Aerospace Research at the University It's at a university in Rome. I can't translate the full thing because they don't speak Italian. Um, but they had, uh, that would be why the booklets were also produced in Italian, I assume. Um, all right. How about, do you want to see the models? There are models of the satellite in the collection. We, we've been looking a lot at a lot of text. Um, I'm going to show some more visual things now for a few minutes. Well, let's start here. I have a little case. SASC 1975. Let me make sure this gets into the camera nicely. Uh, the little card says the Small Astronomy Satellite Project and gives credits. NASA Goddard Space Flight Center Project Management, Mrs. Marjorie R. Townsend. American Science and Engineering Incorporated, uh, Gerald K. Austin. NASA Goddard Space Flight Center SASB experiment, Stephen Derden. The text is minuscule. It's like um, like a two-point font or something. It's very hard to read. <laughs> um, but similar credits to what we just saw. If I open this up, wow, it's an entire little booklet. It's very, very small, very hard to read. Um, oh, it's too close there. I need to autofocus it. There we go. Small astronomy satellite one. Information launched December 12, 1970 from the San Marco Equatorial Range in Kenya. Small Astronomy Satellite 2 was launched again from Kenya. And then Small Astronomy Satellite SASC, which is the third one, sorry. It's hard to get this centered in the camera here. Uh, I'm looking to see monitor uh, these objectives will be accomplished by a launch of a composite of four X-ray experiments by 
from, again, Kenya. So all three of her um, SAS satellite projects were launched from Kenya. And this is made by Balfour, who apparently claimed to be jewelry's finest craftsman. Anything on the specific size of the sassy sets? Um, I'm sure I have that in here. I will look for it in just a moment. Um, this is a really lovely little. So, uh, if viewers are familiar with Star Trek, um, they had like the ship plaque that would go on the ship uh, and had information and dedications and stuff like that. This is kind of like a miniature version of a ship plaque, but for a satellite. Um, it doesn't have like names of the designers and stuff like that. It's just a picture of the satellite, but that's what it reminds me of is ship plaques from, from Star Trek. And I'm not, I, I don't know if ship plaques were a thing in actual NASA. <laughs> Just here for coffee. Have any of us seen Star Trek? Sounds unlikely. Um, I mean, I know some of the audience out there has seen Star Trek, but I can't assume that everybody has. Um, let's see. I've also got, I'm going to take it out of the mylar here so that we get less glare. I can't guarantee no glare. Um, So this is a sticker. Small astronomy satellite, NASA, SASC. Uh, you also have, so NASA's logo here and the Centro Recherche Aerospaziali, um, the Italian Center for Aerospace Research that I'm absolutely certain I am slaughtering the pronunciation in Italian. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, Apparently, they worked, had four major locations involved. Uh, they have the Goddard Space Flight Center, Quito, San Marco in Kenya, and Ascension. Um, Star Trek? <laughs> oh, it, it is indeed. Today is the autumnal equinox. So officially autumn, beginning today. <laughs> but... Yeah. Application instructions. Do not apply in freezing weather. Surface must be thoroughly clean, free from dirt and road grime. This is a bumper sticker. <laughs> um, and then we have an even smaller one. We have a bumper sticker and a baby bumper sticker. Uh, let me see what I've got on the technical specifications of SASC. I think that may have been in the book that we were looking at before. I may have just skipped it. Yes, I do indeed um, have technical specifications for SASC. So the functional control section of the SASC satellite, the structural and thermal design. The basic structure of the functional control, control section of the SASC spacecraft is a cylinder 66 centimeters in diameter and 61 centimeters high, weighing about 120 kilograms. Two platforms, one above and one underneath, made of aluminum honeycomb. Between the two, there are electronics boxes, the battery, the wheel, the nutation damper. Okay, that is a word I need to look up. Uh, nutation. A periodic variation in the inclination of the axis of a rotating object.
OK. So it's, it's a damper to damp down oscillation, or to, to damp down variation in the inclination of the axis of the satellite. Uh, magnetometers, sun sensors, and the star sensor. On the upper platform are two tape recorders and the connectors to which the experiment is attached. And attached to that platform are four solar paddles. And buried in it are the cables used to rotate the solar paddles. Like the procession of a gyroscope. Thank you, Just Here for Coffee. So uh, 66 centimeters in diameter and 61 centimeters high um, for the main component. I don't know how long the um, solar panel wings are. That's not specified on here. Maybe that's in the power system section. Or in, not necessarily in the pamphlet here, but possibly in the actual like project notes, which are in other folders. <laughs> they were so close to having a really nice number there, Portico. <laughs> is that is that where you're why you're lamenting 66? Satellites are smaller than we think they are. <laughs> I mean, there are large satellites, but this was also uh, my brain has no conception as to what size 66 centimeters actually is uh, because my brain does not think in metric because I've never really learned metric. Um, I have also in this collection, I have a SASA and an SASB uh, scale models, one, in, 1 to 20 scale models of the A and the B, two feet and a bit. Thank you, Jester for Coffee. That helps a little bit. Um, these are not assembled models. And as far as I know, we don't have an SASC model in the collection. Uh, but I'm just going to show you this. When I was looking for something to show off uh, and to put in the tweet for today, um, I opened these up and found the, the tester's paints and the tester's cement still in here and promptly uh, photographed them and removed them uh, because those are highly flammable materials that we don't want to keep among the collections. Uh, so there are various options. We could thoroughly drain the containers and wash them out and leave the containers in the collection. Or just note that, the, that we removed them. Um, oftentimes, that'll just be a note saying, these things were removed. Uh, in this case, I took a photograph so that people could actually see what was there um, and just noted that these items were removed from the kit. <laughs> um, but yeah, they had uh, testers 1145 white and testers 1149 flat black as well as the uh, testers cement for plastic models, uh, which all of those were 15 cents at the time. <laughs> 10 for 10 for completeness, minus 911 for safety. Yes. Um, and in here we have all of the pieces to put together a model of the, this is the SASA satellite. So this is the main, main segment. Um, it's got a wooden base to assemble the model on. Um, I don't know for sure. This piece here has some wire and paper. I would need to look at the picture of the satellite to know exactly what this is all about. Um, and then there's just a bunch of little plastic bits. Uh, 
And the SASB model is very similar, um, but you've got the wings. I don't know. There's no instructions. Uh, this, I believe, would stick in here and is probably out. OK, so this metal pole uh, would go in the, in the wooden base and into the model here to stand up the model. <laughs> I mean, if you can find a satellite model, I would say they are definitely fun to put together. The, this one is relatively uncomplicated. Um, the wings would go in. So I'm not going to actually assemble it because that would be a permanent change to the collection and this was unassembled and it will remain so. Um, there's also a piece that would go here. But yeah, this is a, a, a really simple model, but also like pretty cool. Um, it comes with a label to go on there. Small Astronomy Satellite SASA 120 scale. So, um, Again, referring people to Star Trek, if you uh, remember in, um, or if you ever saw Star Trek First Contact, um, there is a scene where there is a line about, you broke your little ships, um, because a bunch of essentially model spacecraft had been broken. Um, and I have to wonder if the idea of including model spacecraft uh, in Star Trek came from the fact that there were these actual models of spacecraft that the people who worked on the spacecraft uh, kept for themselves. I don't know, but I wonder about that. Uh, so that is the SASA model kit. Let's see. I have to get the box to close again. <laughs> uh, we do also have the SASB model kit, which, again, the same testers items were inside. Um, SASB. We have the same basic parts. We have the sticker again. We've got a couple of smaller bits in here, so I'm not going to actually open this one up because I don't want to lose those. Uh, we've got the wings. Um, again, that paper with the little wires. Oh, I don't think the paper is actually part of it. I think the little wire, the little crossed wire, is part of it because if you see, um, if you look at SASC here, And the picture of this satellite, at the end of these two wings, you can see the little crossed uh, antennae. And so I think that that is what this model piece is, because uh, there's a crossed piece of metal. So I believe that that is um, meant to be that antenna that goes at the end of one of the wings. Uh, this one has a piece of paper inside, so I will open that up and read it to you. Um, but here's the main body of this satellite. Uh, it's got this round dome on it, unlike the other one. Let's see what this paper says here. Aha! Assembly instructions! The SASA model did not have these. Let me slide this under the document camera so that you can look at it with me. Assembly instructions, small astronomy satellite, SASB. Magnetometer, main body, antenna A, antenna A, solar paddles, star sensor, solar array, support rod, base, Z-axis torque coil, antenna B, magnetometer, solar attitude detector. 
Remove parts from package and identify each in the picture. Cement detail parts to the main body at places identified. Allow one half hour drying time. Insert support rod and hole in bottom of main body. Insert paddles and slots noting left and right hand configuration. Paint edges, support arm, uh, paint star sensor, wrap Z-axis torque coil, white plastic strip. Oh, what? That's... I had no idea that that little white strip was actually a piece in the model kit. I just, I didn't know what it was, but I didn't realize, wow, nameplate, this one came with three antennae, um, there's actually only one in the box, but it came with three. You love that on the document, they didn't bother specifying these were the assembly instructions for the model. Yeah, no, it says assembly instructions, small astronomy satellite SASB. It does not say it's assembly instructions for the model. If you were noting this on the finding aid, would I add a clarifying note about that? Um, <coughs> probably not, <laughs> to be honest. Um, uh, I would say possibly if I was doing something like a really detailed um, finding aid, but uh, if you go and actually look at the finding aid, um, the, these two model kits are just listed as box of unassembled parts for 120 scale model of SASA uh, and SASB. So there's no actual like inventory of the items within those boxes. And even if this was a really detailed um, finding aid where we detailed like every piece of paper inside of a folder, we probably would not go that detailed here. We would probably still just say unassembled model and leave it at that um, because the model itself is a unit, we probably would not inventory the individual items within the box. But uh, I can guarantee that we definitely wouldn't in, in this case because that finding aid has already been written and because um, we just don't have that kind of staff power. We actually do have the assembly instructions for the other one, they just weren't in the box. Um, and they also just say assembly instructions, small astronomy satellite SASA, <laughs> instead of specifying that they are assembly instructions for a model. I'm just gonna stick those back in the model kit where they belong. Those are kind of fun. Let's see here. Oh, I didn't put this away yet. Let's just drop that back in the box there so it doesn't wander off. Let's see what else I have. MIT. MIT SASC experiment description. Also, uh, if you want to if you want to take a look at the finding aid itself, I have that link. Let me find it because um, I know Kira stepped away. Come on, copy. La la la. Okay. You always wonder about that sort of thing. Um, 
so key squared, it would be wonderful to go into enormous detail on the um, actual like inventory of what's in a collection. Um, I think most people who work with collections in this way, like archivists like myself, um, would love to go into very specific detail about what's in the materials and uh, because that's going to improve findability. It's going to make it easier for people to locate what they're looking for and decide uh, before ever coming in if it's going to be useful for them. Um, but the amount of staff hours that it would actually take to do that is just uh, beyond imagining. Um, we're already buried in so much content uh, that we, could, we can't ever process everything that we already have. So there's just no way we can go into that much detail. Um, here at Virginia Tech, what we end up doing is um, we do what's called folder level description, uh, where what goes in the finding aid is just a label of each individual folder. So a folder is generally going to be, um, as we look at materials, they're organized in some way when we get them unless they're not. But generally, we look to see if there's some sort of existing organization, and then we try to preserve that existing organization as we're moving things into acid-free folders and uh, preservation uh, environment, essentially. Um, and while we're doing that, we try to just come up with a brief descriptive uh, title for each folder of material. Um, so if we had a lot of stuff that was the MIT SASC experiment description, um, this might be the, f like we might have multiple boxes with that same label, um, but we wouldn't ever really go beyond that, uh, which for this, that's probably all the description you need. When it comes to letters, it can be somewhat frustrating um, because if the letters are arranged by who sent them and not by what they're about, um, that can be problematic. A lot of the president's papers for the university, uh, for Virginia Tech University, are arranged by date and then the first letter of the sender's name, uh, which means it's very difficult to find anything useful in those collections of letters because unless you know that you're looking for a letter from a specific person, um, that's not very helpful organization. And something, a directory of uh, the topics addressed in the letters would be much more useful for researchers. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the staff to be able to go in and redo some description to point to it subject-wise. Um, and so we end up with folders that are just labeled uh, letters C through E, uh, but we don't know what's actually in them because we don't go to the item level description to know that, um, like, who the letter was from and to and what it was about. Um, and that's just purely a problem of the amount of time that we have available um, and the amount of stuff that we have to get through. So, um, anyway, if you want to take a look at the finding aid for this collection, I dropped that into the chat there. I will drop it again over on the VTUL Studios channel. Um, and also, feel free to ask questions about archival description. Um, this is an educational show about uh, the archives, so not only are we looking at materials, but I'm happy to talk about what a jo the job of an archivist is and how it's done, um, that kind of stuff, if you have questions. Um, the finding aid there, there are two different links. Uh, it's just two different views of the finding aid for the collection that we're looking at. Yeah, the frustrations of living in linear time. Um, if you pull up the finding aid and you see uh, something listed in the, um, uh, the boxes and folders, whatnot, um, Wow. Uh, as you go down into it, there is a list of actually the container list. That's what I was 
<laughs> Those are the words I was looking for. Um, if you see something listed on the container list that you are particularly interested in me pulling out and showing on stream, do let me know. Um, today, I do not have box one with me. It is currently being used uh, for instruction uh, in a class. But anything in boxes two, three, or four, I can show off today. And I will have box one next week because um, we're going to stick with this collection next week before we look at um, whatever spooky things I can find in the archives for October. Uh, so let's see, this is the MIT SASC experiment description. The overall objective of the SASC experiment is to perform a detailed investigation of those areas of X-ray astronomy which are essential to an understanding of the physical processes involved in the generation of X-rays by celestial bodies. Advanced state-of-the-art techniques will be used to increase our knowledge of X-ray astronomy beyond that which has been or will have been obtained from previous satellite, sounding rockets, or balloons. The areas of X-ray astronomy which will be investigated include the location of X-ray sources to 15 arc seconds, the existence and identification of very weak extragalactic sources, the properties of transient X-ray phenomena associated with novas and supernovas, the absorption of the low-energy diffuse X-ray background by interstellar matter, the long and short-term variations of SCO X1, the detailed energy spectrum of X-ray sources and the background from 0.1 uh, kiloelectron volts to 50 kiloelectron volts, and the periodic time variations of X-ray sources, uh, for example, X-ray pulsars, with periods from 10 to the minus third to 10 to the third seconds. These objectives provide the basis for the organization of the MIT payload. So this is very similar to what we read in the actual booklet that we just looked at. Um, so probably won't spend too much time in, on this document because it appears to be very similar to stuff we already looked at today. Which is not surprising. We had the published version and we looked at the published version, but this is the pre-published item. Uh, ooh. GSFC Group Achievement Award for the Small Astronomy Satellites Project Team. Nomination info to contract and uh, contractor citations. Let's look. All right, we have a list. Um, next week when box one is available, it says there's stuff on women's careers discussions from the 70s and 80s. Um, absolutely key squared. I th that is probably quite interesting. Um, I don't know for sure which parts of box one were pulled uh, for the, or why, like which parts of box one they were focusing on in the class, but um, like the photographs, I would love to show you the photographs. They're in box one, uh, which is fine. I love that this collection um, that honestly does not get used very much um, was being used uh, oh, thank you, uh, GSFC is Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I love that this collection was requested by a student in a first year English class uh, where they're doing an archives project and they had to come in and get familiar with the archives and a student came, uh, requested to see this collection, um, which I love that they found it interesting and came in and looked at it. I love that it got pulled for use in an archives instruction class uh, this week. Um, that class happens to be happening during the same time as this stream, which is why I don't have box one, because uh, it was selected for use in that class and on my stream independently. And we just happened to pick the same day that we needed the collection. Um, and for a collection that doesn't get pulled and used very often, that to me is just awesome. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is from 1976. We have the American Revolution Bicentennial uh, stamp here on the side. National Aeronautics and Space Administration, Goddard Space Flight Center, Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, uh, 
I'm going to read the handwritten text in a moment, but first I will read the, the text of this letter. Dear blank, and you can see the line numbers on the side, uh, I had the honor and pleasure of accepting this SAS Project Team Group Achievement Award for all of us at NASA headquarters on November 11, 1975. I only wish the entire team could have been there for the ceremony. My personal thanks for a job well done goes with this small token of NASA's appreciation. The outstanding success of the SAS project is due to the dedication of many, but I particularly appreciate the significant contribution that you personally made to it as dot 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 dot. Sincerely, Marjorie R. Townsend, SAS Project Manager. So this is a form letter uh, to thank people for their work on the project. Handwritten here, uh, let's see, 40612 tape. Uh, first, set margins, uh, start letter. Second, turn on machine, third, Make sure type spool, I think. Fourth, uh, put on draft. Fifth, push push. Something print. Tape will stop on line 13, turn off, go back and insert name. Center print? I'm not sure. It looks more like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but they're handwritten notes about auto print. Yes, it is auto print. Um, so these are handwritten notes for how to, how to take this form letter and run it through their um, computer system to make multiple letters. which I think the handwritten notes on this are just as interesting as the content of the letter itself. Um, I don't know what computer system they were using, but I, I find it very interesting, the step-by-step -step notes of how to recreate this letter within the system. Um, and apparently you do all of this, it prints this out, and then you go back and add the name afterwards. Let's see what else. Ah, Goddard Space Flight Center Group Achievement Award. Small Astronomy Satellites Project Team. Justification. The NASA and contractor personnel compromising the Small Astronomy Satellite Series Project Team have contributed in a direct and substantial way in making SAS a highly successful mission. The SAS series pioneered the way in high energy astronomy and the difficult challenges in such a mission were overcome only by the superb effort extended by the team members. It is certainly true that the great scientific accomplishments could not have been achieved without personal dedication, many hours of extra effort, and personal sacrifices on the part of the team. Citation. In recognition of the outstanding technical and scientific accomplishments in the conception, development, and successful flight of the small astronomy satellites, and for the personal dedication of the team members in achieving the objectives of three pioneering missions in high-energy astronomy. And we have a lot of names. I will not be reading all of the names, but there are quite a few. Um, two pages, three pages, like three pages of names, and then contractor, contractors that, um, 
were involved, the Applied Physics Laboratory of John, Johns Hopkins University, American Science and Engineering Incorporated, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, L&D Incorporated, Bendix Corporation, Centro Ricerche uh, Aerospaziali, uh, Parsons of California, Gulton Industries, Sconstet Instrument Company, Adcol Indus Incorporated, Spectrolab Incorporated, Ithaco Incorporated, EOS slash Xerox Corporation, Fairchild Industries, LTV Incorporated, Computer Science Corporation, Aeronautic Ford Corporation, formerly Philco Cord Cor Ford Corp, Arthur D. Little, Ball Brothers Research Corporation, Charles Stark Draper Laboratory, uh, which, if you'll recall from last week, um, the papers that we looked at last week or the, the technical manuals that we looked at last week from um, Gerhard Monsbach. Monsbach worked at the Charles Stark Draper Laboratory. Uh, Circuit Technology Incorporated, Comstock and Westcott Corporation, Microtechnology Incorporated, Wilmore Incorporated, and Arwood, Arwood Corporation. Apparently they were all contractors. Uh, and then we have more people from the Scout Project Office. Someone named Tilly, uh, for all of you Star Trek fans out there. Oh, and then we have actual like names of individuals at the different corporate uh, places. Wow. So this is all the product of project management for a major NASA project, uh, actually multiple major NASA projects. Um, and if you've ever done any project management today, uh, you know that there are multiple computer systems, multiple computer programs out there to help you do project management. Um, this project management that uh, Townsend was doing was really before computers were used for that sort of thing. All of her project management was done on paper or with punch card computers, um, which is just amazing to me. Uh, The award should read the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Awards to the contractor's name, the SAS Series Contractor Team Award. Applied Physics Laboratory of the Johns Hopkins University. In recognition of their outstanding efforts in designing and building the spacecraft control sections which permitted the series of three very successful small astronomy satellites to perform their pioneering missions in high energy astronomy. I'm not going to read all of them, but this is pretty cool. I like early NASA history. I mean, this isn't super early. This is 1970s at this point. This is 1975 for these awards, but um, I still think this is pretty cool. We have an actual like announcement from NASA. July 25th, 1975. 1975 NASA Honor Awards. Nominations are now being solicited for the subject awards, which will be presented at the annual NASA Awards Ceremony at headquarters this fall. This year, I am inviting all Goddard employees to submit nominations for the NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement, Exceptional Bravery, Exceptional Service, Equal Opportunity, and Group Achievement Awards. The criteria for these awards are as follows. The NASA Exceptional Service Medal is granted for significant achievement or service characterized by unusual initiative or creative ability that clearly demonstrates substantial improvement in engineering, administrative, space flight, or space-related endeavors which contribute to the programs of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The NASA Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement 
is an award given for unusually significant scientific accomplishments which contribute to the programs of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the Department of Defense, or other government uh, agencies. This award may be given to an individual whose creative efforts are of high order and who has made important contributions to science and related technology either as a scientist or as a member of a team. The Group Achievement Award is an award given to a group or team of individuals who, through technical and managerial com competence, personal dedication, and joint cooperation, have made an outstanding contribution to the space program. The Equal Opportunity Award is given in recognition of outstanding contributions to the Equal Opportunity Program as a result of exceptional dedication and initiative in promoting and assuring equal opportunity for all individuals. The NASA Medal for Exceptional Bravery is an award given for exemplary and courageous handling of an emergency in the NASA program activities by an individual who, independent of personal danger, had acted to prevent loss of human life or government property. Contractor and university personnel may be nominated for the Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal and the Group Achievement Award. To receive consideration for these awards, nominations must be received in the awards office code 225 by August 15, 1975. The format is, to be used is shown below. Signed, John F. Clark, Director. Name of nominee, title of nominee, organizational location of nom nominee, type of award recommended, reason individual is being nominated, approximately 150 words, additional related qualifications, and the signature of the person making the nomination. Of these, the one I find the most interesting is that one for uh, the NASA Medal for Exceptional Bravery here. Courageous handling of an emergency in NASA program activities by an individual who, independent of personal danger, acted to prevent loss of human life or government property. So they risked their life to help save others, or they risked their life to save government property. <laughs> it's that or government property that made that one stand out to me. Like, I get, like, somebody risking their life to save other people's lives. And an award for bravery in those cases certainly seems appropriate. But that award seems to be encouraging people to risk their lives to save government property, which, nah, let the property break. Keep yourself safe. <laughs> For government property, they rescued a pencil from the shredder. An award must be given. <laughs> oh, dear. Let's see. Member of packages, satellite priorities and funding, shared experience program. This one's kind of interesting. We're up to 1977 with this one. So um, after all the SAS stuff, uh, I need a sip of water real quick. So if anybody is uh, new to the show, 95% um, of the time on this show, I have never seen the collections before. I don't know what's in them. And I'm literally just kind of leafing through to see what stands out as interesting. Um, <clears throat> and then I share it with you. So oftentimes, I am not an expert on what's being shared because my expertise is in um, the sociology of communities and uh, archives. Those are the those are the things that I'm educated in. Um, but oftentimes, somebody in chat will know something about what we're looking at, uh, which I find very, very fun. Um, I enjoy sharing this with all of you. And uh, yeah, so here we have um, direct delivery of automated spacecraft using the shuttle. Thoughts for the Designer by Marjorie R. Townsend. 
this being an actual like scientific paper, I'm, I'm not going to end up reading the entire thing, but I may uh, look for some highlights. Not any one pattern, but rather a richness of design approaches characterizes the move to payloads designed for deployment from the space shuttle. There's a bio of Marjorie Townsend where we get a, a picture of her. Uh, Marjorie R. Townsend, M. I don't know what the M means. Uh, manages Goddard's Preliminary si Systems Design Group, responsible for planning and early design of free-flying spacecraft missions. Previously, she was project manager for the small astronomy satellites and then applications explorer missions. Earlier, she worked on electronic systems for Tiros, Nimbus, uh, sorry, Tiros, Nimbus, and Ogo. Uh, an electrical engineer, she worked at NRL before joining NASA in 1959. She served on AIAA's National Capital Section Council, 1973 to 75. Um, that is the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, I believe, is AIAA. Uh, <laughs> the first thing, so the thing that attracted me to this document was the title of the article. Direct delivery of automa automated spacecraft using the shuttle. Thoughts for the designer. The first sentence says, the title of this article should not be taken too literally. While the space shuttle could place many payloads directly into desired orbits, it would not necessarily be very efficient to do so. Usually after being brought into low orbit by the shuttle, a spacecraft payload will get itself into final orbit using anything from the interim upper stage with its own steering system to a tank of hydrazine that relies on the spacecraft for steering. In between these extremes, some spinning upper stages which rely on the space shuttle to point them in the right direction. Uh, for some missions being considered now, the orbital maneuvering system will come into play not to, not to deliver small or medium-sized spacecraft into orbit, but possibly to take an astronaut into orbit for refurbishing tasks. <gasps> I love this. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit here. Uh, part of the problem is too many options. Should we use an expendable launch vehicle? Should we use a sizable booster and make a plane change from the East Coast shuttle? Or should we delay the launch until the West Coast shuttle becomes available? While other agencies may not have the latter option, all of these delivery systems are viable considerations for Goddard's Space Flight Center and each has certain virtues. But the shuttle isn't the only newcomer facing the spacecraft systems designer today. Coincident with the shuttle era are three other major changes. And orbital re support readiness of... Uh, wait, what? That is very strange. Ah, I see. Never mind. I, I, I went and started reading the end of the article before this one because it was on the back of that page. Uh, three other major changes from our previous ways of doing business. The tracking and data relay sy uh, satellite system, TRD TDRSS, the trend towards standardization, and the global positioning system, GPS, see Smith and Chris in the April 1976 A-A. All of these, like the shuttle, are viewed with mixed emotions. Without a doubt, the United States needs to be able to acquire its data and track its satellites independently of any other nation. The TDRSS will permit this. The penalty paid for this ability is a greater burden on the user spacecraft, both in power and volume, with the end result being a limitation on data rate. That in itself may not be all bad, as we must finally analyze all returned data. <clears throat> Fortunately for us, the microprocessor is coming along in time to allow us to do more processing on board, resulting in more efficient use of allowable data rates. I want to know what she says about GPS, though. The global positioning system... Oh, I'll give you a picture while I do this. Uh, there, okay. 
the global positioning system will give a spacecraft's position in orbit precisely and allow us to merge this information with the data as they are transmitted. This will eliminate much computation on the ground and should save an enormous amount of time in data handling, reduction, and analysis. It will therefore save money in ground processing. But all that, do all that does not come without a penalty in spacecraft complexity. Measured in money, weight, and power, um, as in the case of standardization, the shuttle is there to help ameliorate the problems of the increased weight and power. Interesting. I just love that, so the GPS, the global positioning system that she's actually referring to, is what we all have in our cars and on our phones now. It is what we know as GPS. So th this becomes a very technical paper about like delivery of payloads using the shuttle. Um, and pretty cool. It's actually, she's a good writer of a scientific paper. Um, and academic papers are so often super, super dry and not interesting at all. And even as a layperson, that one was interesting. I, I could probably have read the entire thing. Uh, let's see, remote sensing of the atmosphere from environmental satellites. Oh, that one's not by Townsend. Uh, geostationary operational environmental satellite, GOES, GOES DEF data book. OSSA mission plan for the IOC time frame of the space station complex with payload and tool notes. Articles from Goddard Library supporting OSSA info. I'm looking for something that jumps out as particularly interesting. I'm going to pull down the entire box right now because we've only got a few minutes left today. Uh, Magellan pre-launch mission operations report. There's lots of reports. Hubble Space Telescope deployment pre-launch mission operation report. Gamma Ray Observatory. STS-48 joint integrated simulations. Proposal for Small Explorer Program, Astrophysics, Missions and Payloads. International Infrared Space Observatory. Ooh, LISA! They have LISA! The Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. We'll probably look at that next week. Contingency Plan for the Hubble Space Telescope First Servicing Mission. Uh, we'll look at that for the rest of today, and as I said, we are continuing with this collection next week um, when we'll actually have uh, the stuff that was in box one, which includes some of her speeches that she had written for addressing um, women's role in this type of stuff, etc. Um, Hubble Space Telescope First Servicing Mission Contingency Plan. October 1993. Os Office of Space Science, NASA, Hubble, Te Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, I'm gonna turn this page here. Uh, got some names on here for the people who submitted this, introduction, purpose, table of contents, etc. Introduction. In accordance with NASA management instruction 8621.1E, Mishap Reporting and Investigating, the Associate Administrator for the Office of Space Science is responsible for ensuring that plans exist to cope with mishaps and mission failures within his or her jurisdiction, investigating them, reporting the results thereof, and instituting action to prevent the recurrence of such mishaps. Such plans and arrangements are required to be consistent with NHB 1700.1 NASA Basic Safety Manual and NHB 1700.1 V2 NASA Basic Safety 
uh, Safety Manual, Volume 2, Guidelines for Mishap Investigation. The purpose of this plan is to define actions to satisfy the foregoing AAOSS uh, responsibilities for the Hubble Space Telescope first servicing mission. Supersedes and replaces the contingency plan dated February 15th, 1990. Effective immediately. I want to know. Laser interferometry is cool. The LISA project um, from NASA is pretty cool. So the, I, I'm going to want to spend more time with that than the few minutes that we had. So that's why I put it to the side. Uh, definition of HST mishap. A Hubble Space Telescope program mishap is any program-related failure, accident, anomaly, or incident involving Hubble Space Telescope program-controlled flight or test hardware that significantly delays or jeopardizes the Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission or prevents the accomplishment of any level one objective. Whew. This is very dense, uh, but mostly because it's a government agency and they have to conform to certain standards in writing these things. Um, so it's not very plain language. And this is honestly, um, if you've ever worked somewhere uh, where you have an emergency plan or a contingency plan, um, uh, where I worked before here, it was called the BCP. It was a business continuity plan. Um, here at Virginia Tech, they're called continuity of operations plans. Uh, so we refer to it as the COOP. Um, basically, all organizations should have something like that in place. Um, I, for a while, I was a student in emergency administration and management. Um, and... Uh, so emergency planning, this is, this is a contingency plan. So this is like a continuity of operations plan or a business continuity plan. It's just that this is a contingency plan for what they're going to do if something goes wrong during the first servicing mission for the Hubble, te Hubble Space Telescope. So it is very formulaic with net, without a lot of details um, because this is a planning document for Here's who has responsibility. Here's what we do. Here's how we deal with a situation if it arises during this mission. Uh, so not quite as interesting as if it were an after action report detailing what went wrong, uh, which I have not looked to see if those are in here, but I'm guessing not. 13 of the 14 rings are now done, as are the three chains. You're done for the day. 14th ring can wait until tomorrow. I'm happy that it was good background for you while you worked. Tangentially related, a book uh, about ast astronaut Catherine Sullivan's memoir, um, Handprints on Hubble, is a fun read about the launch and repair of the space telescope. Thank you for the recommendation, Key Squared. Um, Catherine Sullivan's memoir, Handprints on Hubble. So if you want uh, more about the Hubble Space Telescope and... Um, its launch and its repair, uh, that has been recommended from the chat. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I don't have more time today. Uh, so we will be returning to Marjorie Rhodes Townsend's papers next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time um, here on VTUL Studios Twitch and on Rogan27, uh, both of the channels. Um, so I would love to have you come and join me again there. Uh, thank you again, 16-Bit Eric, for bringing over the whimsies. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming to join me during the stream. Um, yeah, look forward to more Marjorie Rhodes Townsend next Wednesday. And then in the month of October, I will be looking for spooky content for you. That might be spooky stories from our British and American literature collections from... Uh, most likely the late 1800s, if I can find them. Definitely we will be sharing uh, the myriad collections where we have actual human hair among the papers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is. A lot of people find human hair in archival collections somewhat creepy. Uh, but we'll talk about why it's there and um, you know why it ended up in our archives. Uh, so that'll be fun and interesting. But that is coming up in October. Um, 
but yeah, thank you all for so much for coming today. I'm going to look and just see who we're going to raid today. Um, I generally tend to, since this is specifically an educational stream and I've got the university's channel uh, joining in this raid, uh, we tend to pick an educational streamer at the end of this. Um, oh, and this week is Sea Otter Awareness Week at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, so we are going to head over to Monterey Bay for some sea otters. Uh, and that is where we're going to go. I hope you will join in that raid. Um, but yeah, thank you all so very much for being here. And I will see you next time.